in light of injustices and cries for justice, we thought it would be timely um, as we hold the Word of God above all else um, to look to what the Word of God says about justice. One of the greatest places that we can find um, cries for justice in and, and a, a, um, a judgment against injustice is Amos. And so we're going to be spending the next couple of months, few months, probably no one else, uh, through Amos. I want to pray, because I feel that's important, <laughs> that the Lord would um, just be with us tonight, that the Lord would illuminate His words, um, that the Holy Spirit would move, that my words would fall to the ground, and that God's words would go forth. Let me pray. I'll give a short background. I'm going to read through the whole chapter, pretty much the whole chapter of chapter 1, and then I'm going to do my best to go back and through and break it down. Okay? So let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us. Lord God, I thank you for being a faithful God. I thank you for being a righteous God that hates injustice. And yet, Lord, because of your righteousness, we can't understand what justice is apart from you. And so our cry for, for justice, even um, in our country right now, Lord God, in all the turmoil and all the brokenness, I can't even help to think of what happened just this past week. Lord, I pray that these things would break our hearts and break the hearts of your people. But that it would break our hearts to see a man shot seven times in front of his kids. They would break our hearts to see a city in turmoil being looted and rioted. That it would break our hearts to see division and hatred and um, just ideologies that aren't of you. And so, Lord, I pray that in all of our cries for justice, in all of our cries for peace, we would look to Jesus Christ and His Word as our only hope as our only answer. And so, Lord, right now, we look to you to speak to our hearts. May these words from the 8th century B.C., Lord, ring true in our hearts and lives today. May we see how relevant they are for 2020. So, Lord, we're asking you to speak to them. And may we hear from you. And may we be ready to hear and ready to respond. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Just a little background. Amos, herdsman, farmer, tree farmer, into color. Right? A nobody. Nothing special about him. He wasn't in any kind of school of prophets. He wasn't in a line of prophets. He was just a dude that was a farmer. And a herdsman, he, he breeded sheep, he breeded cattle. And yet the Lord showed up to Amos, his, actual, his name actually means burden bearer, one who was burdened. And as the Lord showed himself to Amos and said, Amos, I am choosing you, a nobody herdsman, tree farmer, to come speak on my behalf to a world that is broken, to a world that is taken, to a generation that is unjust, and I want you to cry out against it. And what we learn from just his name, and just his calling to warn of God's coming judgment. I we can look at our own, our own lives, just a few weeks ago, I'm going to look at our own lives and, and look at Amos and say, am I one who carries a burden? Has God burdened my heart in such a way that I had something to say to our world today? There's so many voices today. 
There's so many people speaking. The loudest voice needs to be the voice of God's people. I'm convinced of that. But what's the point of crying out unless the Lord puts a burden on our heart? And that's what we see breaks our heart and causes us to speak and causes us to respond. And what Amos did was he confronted the empty religion. He confronted the oppression of the poor. He, he, he confronted the, the total disregard for God's covenant promises and God's covenant commands. And he cried out not only to God's people, but to the world. To nations that surrounded Judah and Israel. And so, we just got to the first two verses two weeks ago, and tonight I'm going to read verses 3, 1, 3 to 2, 3. But before we get into that, I want you to think about a couple things. First thing is this, in 2 Peter 2 verses, or in 2 Peter 1 verses 21, we're told this from God's Word. He said, because no prophecy ever came by the will of man, instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So as we study Amos, as we read these words tonight, these aren't just mere words of Amos. Peter tells us that these words are the very words of God that carried, that were carried along through Amos by the Holy Spirit's working and the Holy Spirit's moving and the Holy Spirit's communicating. Yes, his heart was ready. Yes, his heart was prepared. Yes, his heart was burdened. And it seems to me like when our hearts are in that place, God can show up and reveal to us. And the Holy Spirit can work and move and speak. The second thing I want us to think about as we read these verses is this. All of Amos about to say is that all of Amos, all of what Amos is about to say rests on this profound theological assumption. And it's this. There is a God whose name is Yahweh, who has the power over the whole earth whose righteousness will not tolerate unrighteousness on the part of any nation. He's not just the God of Israel or Judah. He reigns over all and will judge all. There is a God. He is righteous. And he does not tolerate unrighteousness. And because of that, he will judge I've been listening to Alistair Bay. I think he's a Scottish or Irish preacher. I mean, he's got a cool accent. And he said this as he gathered, as he gathered his thoughts for Amos and he began to, to speak in one of his messages on Amos. Here is this God who we know that speaks in a still small voice. I mean, you know that God. A God that speaks in a still small voice is also the God that speaks in a profound and mighty tone. That's what we get in Amos. In Amos 1, verses 2, right at the end, right at the beginning, he said, The Lord roars from Zion. You better know it's coming. We're going to look at three things today. A pattern, a people, and principle. Pattern, people, principle. Let's read it. The Lord says, there's so much in here, so I'm going to read it and break it down. I'm going to skip so much. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Damascus for three crimes, even four, because they thrust Gilead with iron sledges. Therefore, I will send fire against Haziel's palace, and I will consume Benhadad's citadel, and I will break down the gates of Damascus, and I will cut off the ruler from the valley of Asia, and the one who wields the scepter from Beth Eden. 
the people of Aaron will be exiled to her. The Lord has spoken. Imagine Amos saying these things. I don't know if he went from city to city, from king to king. I don't know if he just wrote a bunch of letters and said, who knows what he did. But imagine the weight and the burden that he was carrying, saying this, the Lord has spoken. He will judge. Verse 6, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Gaza for three times even four because they exiled the whole community, handing them over to Eden. Therefore, I will send fire against the walls of Gaza, and it will consume its citadels. I will cut off the ruler from Ashdod, and the one who wields the scepter from Ashkelon. I will also turn my hand against Ephraim, and, and the remainder of the Philistines will perish. The Lord has spoken. Verse 9, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Tyler for three crimes, even four. Because they handed over a whole community of exiles to Edom and broke a treaty of brotherhood. Therefore, I will send fire against the walls of Tyre, and I will consume its citadels. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Edom for three crimes, even four. Because he pursued his brother with the sword, he stifled his compassion, his anger tore at him continually, and he, and he harbored his rage and sexually. Therefore, I will send fire against the man, and I will consume the citadels of Basra. Verse 13, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing the Ammonites for three times and before, because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge their territory. Therefore, I will send fire to the walls of Rabbah, and it will consume its citadels. There will be shouting on the day of battle and a violent wind on the day of the storm. Their king and his princes will go into exile together. The Lord has spoken. Thank you. Verse 2, what, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. I will not elect from punishing Moab for three times even four because he burned the bones of the king of Eden to love. Therefore, I will send fire against Moab, and it will consume the citadels of Herod. Moab will die with a tumult, the shouting and the sound of the ram's horn. I will cut off the judge from the land and kill all of its officials with him. The Lord has spoken. Woo! The Lord has spoken. And you ask the question, what does Amos mean by a lion roars from Judah? That's what he means. And tonight I'm going to do my best to show us this pattern of how God works, this pattern of how He speaks, this pattern of how He moves, and this pattern of how He judges nations. It's an historical pattern. These are a series of oracles that Amos begins to proclaim, that he begins to, to cry out a pattern of how specifically God deals with people. Not just his people, but all people. And in, this, in these oracles, he gives a nation, a reason, and a judgment. Let me tell you this, these are all judgments against Israel's enemies. If you can see the, on the screen tonight, all these red circles around these nations. And you can see Israel and Judah in between all of these nations. These are nations that wreak havoc on God's people for years and years and years. You can read about it all throughout the pages of Scripture. Really, in First and Second Kings, man, this is so real. The devastation that was caused. The first thing that Amos says here is these words: "For three crimes, even four. For three crimes, even four. And this is a Jewish idiom that means an indefinite number that has finally come to an end. In other words, Amos is saying, for sin after sin after sin after sin, I am a patient God, but my patience has run out. And we have to know this tonight, that God is patient. God is long-suffering with sinners. Second Peter 3.9, the Lord does not delay his promise, 
as some understand delay, but it's patient with you. Let me say that again. He's patient with you. Not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. You see, Amos says for three times, even for him, time and time and time and time again, sin after sin after sin after sin, right? God held back his fury. He held back his roar from Judah. But guess what, nations? Guess what, Damascus? The lion is about to roar and his patience has run out. There's a point where God does say, you must have been And there's a reality that every single one of us, whoever's listening tonight, whoever's here tonight, and this is a painful reality, a heavy reality, and it's this. Deliberate, unrepentant sin does not go in the Deliberate, unrepentant sin does not go in the He will judge. Let me pause right here because that's heavy. I'm actually going to do that. Doesn't it make the beauty of the cross so much greater? Because the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. All that patience, all that time after time after time after time, that's who bore the weight of that on the cross for us is one and only Son, Jesus Christ. That's what it means that we have a Savior in that. He says, Amos says, I will send fire. I will send judgment. I will send destruction. I will send my divine wrath. And remind you, these are all nations outside of the covenant of God. And as we read through these nations, these six nations that Amos continues to to talk about. Many historians, and as you read the scriptures, history tells us that most of, if not all of these prophecies, prophecies came true within 50 years. Some it took a little longer, but that's pretty crazy. That's his pattern. His pattern is this. There's a nation, there's a reason why they're being judged, and judgment is coming. Here's when Amos brings up the people. The first group that he brings up, the first nation he brings up in, in verse 3 is Damascus. Damascus was the capital of Syria. I'm not going to break down everything that he says here, but there's a reason and a judgment. So I'm going to give you nation reason and judgment. The reason why... God was going to bring judgment on Damascus is this. They decimated God's people with cruelty and brutality. Amos cries out and says that they fled God's people in the field. I don't know if that's figurative or if that's literal, but most the, uh, theologians take that as a literal thing, that they not only defeated God's people, but they took them and they laid them out into the fields and they thrust them with hammers that they would crush grain with in the fields. Brutality. It wasn't enough that they destroyed the land. It wasn't enough that they took them into captivity. They wanted to annihilate them and destroy them and brutally murder them. He says they slashed them in the fields. Here's the judgment. You can read about it in 2 Kings 13. King Josiah comes in and defeats ben three times. Then the Assyrians come in and finally subdued Syria and took them into captivity. But when they took them into captivity, it wasn't like they just lost the battle. It wasn't like they lost the war, but they were crushed. They were conquered and its king killed and its people deported. All of what Amos prophesied when he said the Lord has spoken. Second nation in verse 6 is Gaza. Gaza was the capital of uh, the Philistines. You know, the Philistines are what? 
the big giants, right? This is what they do. This is their reason. Wholesale slavery. They deported and enslaved large numbers of God's people, men, women, and children, with total disregard for humanity. And God was tolerated. So judgment came. And God's judgment on the Philistines came in the days of Uzziah. Second Kings 18, you can read about it. The Assyrian invaders under Sargon and the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. The slave masters themselves were taken into exile and put into slavery. The third nation he brings up is Ireland, the capital of Phoenicia. What did they do? And it says that they delivered up God's people in, in violation of a peace act. They made a treaty. And they broke the treaty with their brothers. And they took a whole community and handed them over to exile. What happens to Tyre? In 332 BC, under Alexander, I think under Alexander the Great, he came in and wiped Tyre off the face of the earth and left them. Nation four against Edom. What did Edom do? The reason why he judged Edom, they denied forgiveness. They denied compassion. They relentlessly pursued with hatred and violence. So God brings judgment on the Edomites. Edomites were known for living in the crest of the rock. It says in Obadiah chapters 3 and 4 that they, they, they made nests among the stars, boasting about their fortresses. That they were impregnable, that nobody, no nation could ever touch them. But the Lord destroyed their nation so thoroughly that nothing is left today except ruins. When the Romans attacked Jerusalem in AD 70, they destroyed what was left of Edom. And Edom was no more. Is there any present day application here? When you think about what they did, when you hear the descriptions of how they treated people, how they treated people with total disregard for their humanity, I can't help but to say, you know what, I don't have to open up Amos chapter 1 to read about all the vile hatred and, and injustice that happened thousands of years ago in, in 800, what is it, 800 BC. I can open up the newspaper today. Am I right? I can turn on Facebook today and see lack of compassion, brutal hatred. We have to look too far back, even in this own country, and see the, the pain and the ills and the evil of slavery. And the brokenness that it caused, even to this day. You see how relevant the pages of Scripture and how they speak to us today? The fifth nation, 113, and they devastated God's people and covered his kingdom expansion. More and more territory, more and more terrorism, and they did whatever they could do to do. The judgment came. The Assyrians came in and swept over the land. Not only did Amos predict their destruction, but also Ezekiel predicted their destruction. They heard it from two people in the Last one, two, one to three. The sixth nation that Amos cries out against is Moab. They desecrated the dead in acts of disrespect and de degradation. And it said that they raided tombs. I had to look that up. Like, what, what does that mean? Did you guys catch that when you read that? 
the three times he before because he, he burned the bones of the king of Edom to life. You know what they did? They actually went to the graves and ripped open the graves of people they already killed and burned their bones. Utter destro- utterly destroying them. There was nothing left. They didn't want a grave. They didn't want a, a bones in a, in a grave. They wanted to destroy it all. You see the evil. No life is also taken by the Assyrians. Their land was taken in the nation of Moab is no more. Part of the reality is we don't have to look back to the Old Testament for the most part. This still happens today. And here's the beauty of Amos. Here's what I want you to see tonight. Because I think we can read all this and our hearts become so heavy. And I think that's what Amos is what it looked like. It was burdened by what he saw. Our hearts should be burdened by what we see. And what Amos tells us is not only that God sees it and that God will judge, but also that God is completely 100% in control of all of it. Can you rest in that tonight? Can you rest in that tonight that you can look, man, across this nation? You can look to, man, all I had to do this past week was look on Facebook and see the utter disregard of God's people towards one another. And yet I read Amos and God says, I see, I have an answer, and I'm in control. The pattern of the people. And then he gives us some principles. This is what I would apply to us tonight. Four principles that we can gain from Amos. And as I read these, there's descriptions of what happened in Amos' day. Please, as I read these, you can't hurt but not to think about today. One is this. People made in the image of God should never be treated as less than God. People made in the image of God should never be treated as less than God. They have zero compassion. Their anger tore against nations. They harbor rage. They sold men, women, and children into slavery. They utterly destroyed them in white out countries. They raided graves. They ripped open the, the stomachs of women that were pregnant in order to enlarge their territory. In order to to gain something selfishly out of it. Does that remind you of anything today? People made in the image of God should never be treated as less than. Two, God does not tolerate a heart that is full of evil. God does not tolerate a heart that is full of evil. We're living in an age where there's not just two sides disagreeing with one another, closing it. People are so lost and so broken that it's enraging people with hate. Towards their fellow men. Towards their neighbor. Towards someone that looks different than them. Towards someone that has a different opinion than them. And in this house, it says, God does not tolerate it. I'll tell you what, tonight I'll be completely honest. There's times when maybe hate and anger wells up inside me. 
tell you what, in my own sin, it could well up to the point of hatred. Not you or not. God does not tolerate a heart that is full of hate. Three, God will punish those that abuse the helpless. God will punish those that abuse the helpless. Think about the helpless in our day. The unborn, the impoverished, the broken, the hurt. The ostracized. Those that we fear because we don't know. Those that don't think it's in us. God will punish those that abuse the helpless. I mean, that's not happening today. So I say, you don't have to look for it. Full vengeance has no justifiable place in human behavior. Spit out all these kind of verses that people know and abuse and take out of context. Vengeance is mine, it says the Lord. I for an eye, two for a tooth. You know, all these kind of like, I've seen it all this week. But what do we start this message off with tonight? There is a God. He is all powerful over all the earth. Who is righteous and he will not tolerate unrighteousness. The vengeance is this. He will judge. And here's the thing, folks. He will judge us. He will judge me. It's easy for us tonight to feel like angels. Isn't it? To point out everybody around us that God needs to bring his judgment down upon us. And fail to say, woe is me. For my power, I'm clean, I haven't done that. I'm a man of unclean lips. Speaks to us today. I believe tonight that we are deeply in need of His words. Deeply in need of His wisdom. And deeply in need of a reminder that we have a more powerful God who is righteous and who does just sin. But He's also patient. Is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. That is what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to close with tonight. I said that when Amos read these nations, or cried out against these nations, prophesied against these nations, they were all nations in direct opposition to God's people. They were the enemy. But for God's people, for Israel and Judah of that day, that probably felt so good to hear Amos cry out against Edom, to cry out against Tyre, to cry out against Gaza, to cry out against Ammon, to cry out against Moab. It probably felt so good. Like, yeah, Amos did it. Yes, God. Rip them to shreds. Do to them what they did to us. Well, what we'll learn about next week is God's people are not the best. And I'll get into that next week, but judgment does begin in that sense. 
the best we could. But here's our sadness. As we go through Amos, as we learn about the righteousness of God, the challenge is the lion roars of Judah in 2020 is this. Lord, speak to your people today. Speak to my heart today. Reveal to me the brokenness, the sin, the injustice, even in my own life. The pride and arrogance that says they deserve it and I don't. That's our challenge. Because I believe that when God deals with our own hearts, He will use us, like Amos, to be a people with a burden that cry out to a generation that so desperately needs to hear that we have an Almighty God who is patient. We have an Almighty God who judges sin. We have an Almighty God who is righteous and can't stand unrighteousness. People won't hear that message unless God does a work in our own lives so that message becomes real to us. Man, I don't deserve any of this. God's grace has been so good that Jesus saw my sin and still loved me. Not only that, not only did he see my sin, he took it upon himself and crossed the Calvary and died for me. Because in my life, sin after sin, the third time, the fourth time, time and time again, I turned and walked away. And then, by the grace of God, he saved me. He's still a patient God tonight. It's, there's still time. There's still time to turn to Him. Because you best believe He will judge the living, unrepentant sin. Let's pray. Lord, I'm asking you tonight that you would find me in a place that my heart is heavy, that my heart is broken. You would find me in a place where all I can do is cry out to you. And say, God, I need you. I'm going to be desperate for you. I well, thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for our time and time again. You forgive, you heal. Your soul, your love, your love. And Lord, as we look around the world today, plagues, disease, hurricanes, injustice. Evil hearts, vengeance, hatred, lack of compassion. No concern for others who are made in the image of God. But I pray you would give us your heart, and you would give us a burden like Jesus. 
and now in 2020, your people, your church, but I'm going to pray specifically tonight that your church in Coastal, that Providence Church Coastal, will be so burdened by what we see, Lord God, that it, it causes us to cry out to you. It causes us to look to you as our only hope. And Lord, we would be raised up for such a time as this to point people to the one, the only one, where justice is found, where justice is rightly given. His name is Jesus, and he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So, Lord, change us with your word. Continue to allow our hearts to, allow it to resonate even in our hearts this week. And reveal those things in our lives, Lord, that you need to work with. Those principles that we learned tonight. And may the words of Amos speak to our hearts today. Fight with us, and I pray these things in your name. Amen.